Thank you, Jesus. Would you join me now for just a moment and right where you are, whether you're in your living room on the live stream or whether you're in your car, would you take just a moment and would you just give God thanks for his faithfulness today? Would you do that? Just take a moment and give him thanks. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that we can depend on you in every situation we find ourselves in. Lord, it doesn't matter where we are or what's going on. God, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can depend on you and we can put our trust in you. We can put our faith in you. You are a trustworthy God. You're a faithful God in every situation. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for that faithfulness. Lord, we know that you have a good track record and you've done it before and you can do it again, Lord, in every life, in every heart, and we thank you today. God, we ask you that wherever we may be uh, hearing the word of the Lord today, God, that somehow you will open our hearts, open our hearts, open our minds, help us to receive what you're saying to us today. Lord, we will not fail to give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Aren't you glad today that you serve a faithful God who's faithful in every situation? He's faithful in every situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I serve a faithful God today. Well, I want to welcome you, and I, I want to thank you for being out here on this beautiful Sunday morning. You know, there's something about us gathering. Well, it's beautiful somewhere here in America, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that it's sunny, and probably today when I get home, I'll get a call from my parents telling me how beautiful it was in Tampa uh, this morning. But uh, there's something about being able even to do this that brings a sense of community to what we're doing as we worship and as we look into the Word of the Lord together. So... Thank you so much for your faithfulness, and thank you for being here. And uh, I wanted to let you know that we are thankful to the Lord for the tools that he's given us to be able to do this. But it's not going to be this way forever. It's not going to be this way forever. 
there will come a day, and uh, we're praying that it'll be very soon that uh, we can meet together in our sanctuary and be able to worship together. But until then, we'll use the tools that God has given us, and we'll use them the best way we can to get the gospel of the kingdom out. And so once again, thank you for your faithfulness in every single way. I want to say as your pastor how grateful I am that you have been faithful in your giving. Some of you bring the Lord's tithe and your offerings and you drop it in the bucket on your way out of the parking lot on Sunday morning. We thank you for that. Others of you have been mailing it in and we thank you for that. Others take advantage of our online giving and they give that way. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, your giving pays off. And I wanted to let you know that no matter what's been going on, all of the obligations of our church are met. And they're met on time. And God is providing for the needs of his church. And not only is he providing for the needs of his church, but he's providing for the needs of his people. Because I am convinced that when we take care of God's house, he takes care of our house. And uh, I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you believe it too. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, whether you're sitting in your living room this morning, or you're sitting in your car, or you have your tablet maybe that you're using for your Bible, I want to ask you to go to the Old Testament. For those of you that are new to your Bibles, the Old Testament is the front part of your Bible. I want to ask you to go to the book of 2 Kings. There are two books of the Kings, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. I want to ask you to go to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. And uh, I'm going to read about six or seven verses to you today. Then we're going to come back and take a look at those verses. But when I was thinking about what title I would give to what I feel like the Lord wants me to say to you today, the only thing I could come up with was a one-word title, the word breakthrough. The word breakthrough. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready for a breakthrough. I'm about ready for a break out. Uh, amen. I'm about ready for a breakthrough. And I told the team as we were praying together this morning that uh, I had a dream last night, and it was a, a wonderful dream. It was a dream of uh, this whole pandemic was over, and uh, we were able to gather as we're accustomed to gathering and I walked in the sanctuary of our church and it was so full that the ushers were having to find seats for people and help them be seated and here's the beautiful thing about that dream I did not feel surprised in my dream in fact people in the dream asked me about it and I told them in the dream I'm not surprised at all because all along I believe that God is up to something that God is taking what the enemy means for the destruction of the church and God is turning it around for our good. And so I'm expecting good things to happen and I'm about ready for a breakthrough. I'm about ready for a breakout uh, of the presence of God, the Spirit of God. And uh, so that was a great title that I wanted to give it. What I really want to talk to you about is what do you do when you feel surrounded? What do you do when you feel surrounded. So look with me at 2 Kings chapter 7. I'm reading to you from the New King James translation. And here's how it goes. Beginning at verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time, a sea, now a sea was about eight gallons by volume, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs, which would have been about 16 gallons by volume, of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. 
And you'll see in just a moment why that was going to be such a miracle. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? That's an interesting question. Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left their camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys. And they fled for their lives. Now let me give you just a little bit of background about this story. The story actually covers a couple of chapters. But we find ourselves in the city of Samaria that was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel at this time. And Samaria was under siege by their enemy, the Syrians. Ben-Hadad, who was the king of the Syrians, had sent his army to capture the city of Samaria. But understand, warfare was waged a little differently back in those days than today. There were no smart bombs. There were no cruise missiles. And oftentimes, cities were so fortified with walls and gates that a conquering army could not simply come in and overrun the city. But what they would do is come and surround a city and lay siege to it. The thinking was, if we can surround this city long enough, their water will run out, their food will run out, the basic supplies where life will run out, and the people in the city will have to surrender just to survive. And this was the strategy of the Syrians. They had laid siege to the city of Samaria. But I don't know how you're feeling, but there are days during this pandemic that I feel a little bit under siege. I feel like that I am surrounded. There are days that I feel like I'm surrounded by bad news and bad circumstances. The jobs report is bad. The economic front the news is bad. The health care front, the news is bad. The future somehow feels uncertain, and we wonder, how are we going to break out of this? How are we going to have a breakthrough? We feel surrounded by everything that is in our lives. And we begin to ask questions like, will we ever be able to break through this? Will we ever have our lives back? Are we ever going to be uh, normal again? Or are we slowly going to be emotionally and spiritually starved to death? And is there going to come a point where we're going to have to surrender? And even if this does come to an end, we're not sure what life will look like. Pastor, I feel under siege. I feel surrounded. And I'm not sure how I can even move forward or if we'll ever really recover from what we're going through right now. But I didn't come this morning to stand out here with it raining and it cold to bring you bad news. I came this morning to bring you good news. You may be feeling surrounded. You may be feeling like you're under siege. You may feel like everything around you is contrary to what you have believed. But I came to tell you today that there is a way to have breakthrough. There is a way to exercise faith. 
that life after corona may look different, but God still has the future under his control. And even if I'm under a stay-at-home order, I can have an emotional breakthrough. I can have a spiritual breakthrough when I understand God's way of bringing us out and I begin to do things God's way. And so I came today with some simple answers. I didn't say they were easy. I said they were simple. The two things are not always the same thing. But I came today to bring you some simple answers. And I want us to look at this story in 2 Kings chapter 7. If you'll look at it with me for just a moment. I want to look at it and I want to apply what we can learn from this Old Testament story. Here's principle number one. And it's very simple. Learn to take God at his word learn to take God at his word now remember the city of Samaria was completely surrounded by the Syrian army they were starving the the people of Samaria out of existence they were in a seemingly hopeless situation if you went back to the previous chapter chapter 6 you would see how hopeless the situation was now some of you were raised in difficult conditions i know some of you were raised in the country and uh, you've told me if it wasn't for pinto beans and cornbread you would have starved to death as a child and uh, some of us feel like maybe you know we were disadvantaged because perhaps we ate that as a child but things had gotten really bad in samaria the bible tells us that they were eating doves dung They were collecting it, and they were selling it at the market, and people were eating that. They were eating donkey heads. They had even resorted to cannibalism. There's a story in chapter 6 of two women that agreed, we'll eat my child today and we'll eat your child tomorrow. And the second woman reneged on the deal. They had resorted to cannibalism in order to satisfy their appetite. And of course, the king of the city was blaming it on Elisha, the man of God. But it was a hopeless situation. There was no help coming from other governments. There was no help coming from neighboring cities or kingdoms. They were absolutely on their own, and the situation looked hopeless. But I want to direct your attention back to verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 7. The Word of God says, but a word came from the Lord. The prophet Elisha stands up and says, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, by this time tomorrow, food will be plentiful. That's what that uh, sea of fine flour and two seas of barley, that's what that was all about. He said, by this time tomorrow, in 24 hours, food is going to be plentiful because God says that it's going to be plentiful. And here's what I know. The government can make promises it can't keep. Employers can make promises they can't keep. But I'm here to tell you, if there is anything in this universe that can change hopeless-looking circumstances, it's when thus says the Lord. It's when the Word of the Lord begins to speak. Then things begin to change. We're getting information from a lot of different sources. But I want to encourage you to go to the word of the Lord and take God at his word. I don't know about you, but I have been praying some of the Psalms over my home and over my family. I made a decision to take God at his word. And a lot of the sources that you get, things from are going to be in direct contradiction to what God is saying so you and I face a choice who will we choose to believe are we going to choose to believe God and what he says or are we going to choose to believe those that are in contradiction to the word of the Lord pastor where can I get a word from the Lord go to your Bible 
Go to your Bible. You can get a word from the Lord. It may come through preaching or teaching. It may come through a devotion that you read or hear. Sometimes the word of the Lord comes through a prompting of the Holy Spirit. But I want to remind you today that we are people of the word of God. We are people that trust the word of God and believe the word of God. And when God speaks up and when God says something, it doesn't matter who else contradicts it. Let God be true and every man a liar. And the word of the Lord is powerful enough to change every circumstance. He is still God. He is still God. He still cares according to what Jesus said to us in the Gospels. He still cares more for you than the grass of the field or the birds of the air. He is still God. He has not lost his ability to provide for his children, even in times of shortage. He is still God. He has not changed his mind about the plans that he has for you, plans to give you a future and plans to give you a hope. He is still God, and you can still trust his word. Take God at his word. You say, Pastor, isn't it risky to take God at his word? Let me show you where the danger is. The danger is in choosing not to believe what God says. Verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 7, the prophet Elisha stands up and boldly declares, Thus says the Lord, by this time tomorrow food will be plentiful. But verse 2 says, there was an officer present, a man on whose hand the king leaned who refused to believe the word of the Lord. In fact, he says to the prophet, if the windows of heaven could be opened up, this kind of deliverance could not come in just 24 hours. There's no way this can happen. There's no way this can change overnight. The prophet's response to him was chilling. The prophet said, it will happen. And he said, you will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat of it. And I want you to know that the prophet's word came to pass because when the news came later in the story that there was food in the camp of the Syrians, this officer that served the king was standing at the gate of the city and the people rushed out to get the food and they trampled him and he could see the blessing with his eyes. He could see the fulfillment of the word of God with his eyes, but he never got to eat of it. I am determined. I don't want to just see others blessed because they take God at His Word. I don't want to just hear the testimonies of others who decided to take God at His Word. I want to be the kind of person that believes God and that believes God when He says to us that our best days are not behind us. Our best days are in front of us. I want to believe God when the Lord says things may look different, but God is the best there ever was at taking lemons and making lemonade, and He somehow is going going to work all of this out for the good of his church and the good of his kingdom. I want to be a person that takes God at his word. Then secondly, not only do I want to take God at his word, but I want to take positive action based on God's word. Verses 3 and 4 of 2 Kings 7, the story shifts now to the story of four men that are dying with leprosy and they're sitting at the gate of the city. And one day they wake up, and I don't know which one of the four it was, but one of them spoke up and said, Fellas, we're dying. I have a question for you. Why are we just sitting here until we die? If we go into the city, we're going to die of starvation like everyone else. If we sit here at the gate of the city, we will either starve or die of the leprosy that plagues us. But what if we take positive action? What if we do something about our situation? What if we go into the camp of the Syrians and they'll either feed us or they'll kill us, one or the other. Either way, we're going to die anyway. So what do we have to lose? And I want to say to you this morning a very bold statement that you have nothing to lose by trusting God. 
You have nothing to lose by trusting God. Sitting and doing nothing is not an option. Sitting and wishing is not an option. Sitting and thinking about what might have been is not an option. What do you have to lose by taking God at His word and taking positive action and acting on what God says. I can tell you right now, there are a lot of us that what we're doing is not working for us. What with the direction we're going is not working for us. There is an answer. Find out what God says. Take positive action. Why sit we here until we die? We are not going to do that. We are going to get up and we are going to move forward and we are going to claim what is ours as children of God. We are people of action. I want to encourage you today to listen to what God's Word says. Pay attention to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. There's some of us that the Holy Spirit is saying to us, you need to use some of this time to rest. See it as a time of Sabbath and rest because coming on the heels of this is going to be a time of great activity. Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying to use this time wisely. Maybe the Lord's been prompting you that there's a book you need to read. Maybe the Lord has been prompting you that there's an online class that you need to take. Maybe the Lord has been prompting you to pick up a phone or send a text or send an email to that friend or neighbor that needs encouragement. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been prompting you to give something away to someone else in the middle of your own need. But what I'm saying to you is don't just sit and die. Find out what God says and begin to take positive action. You've got nothing to lose by your obedience. Let me give you some biblical examples. In the same book we're looking at today, 2 Kings, in chapter 3 of 2 Kings, there was a king by the name of Jehoshaphat who was facing a huge Moabite army that he did not have the power to overcome. And so they called for the man of God. They called for Elisha the prophet. And they asked Elisha to come and give them a word. And a prophet came and a, and a prophet began to speak to them. And here's what God said to them. I know you're facing the Moabites. I know you don't have the strength and the power to overcome them. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to dig ditches. Something that made absolutely no sense. Something that had nothing to do with warfare. It had nothing to do with arraying themselves for battle. God said, dig ditches. But you know what? They knew that the battle was lost anyway. They knew they were powerless without God to have the victory in this circumstance. So you know what they did? They got busy and dug ditches. They were not just going to sit where they were and die. They got busy and they dug ditches ditches. And let me tell you what happened. When the sun rose the next morning, God miraculously filled those ditches with water. And when the Moabites saw the ditches, they looked red. And the Moabites thought the Israelites had turned on one another and killed one another. And there was blood running in the streets. And they hurried from their positions unprepared to do battle. And Israel was able to destroy the Moabite army because they they decided they had nothing to lose by obeying God. God brought the victory in the New Testament. There is a centurion whose daughter died. And he asked Jesus to come to his house and heal his daughter. Jesus was on his way to heal the girl. And the servants of the centurion came and said, Don't trouble the master. She's dead. She's already gone. There's nothing the master can do. But Jesus looked at the centurion and said, everything will be okay if you only believe. Will you take a chance? Will you let me come? And the centurion was risking that people would make fun of him. He was risking that others wouldn't understand. But he decided he had nothing to lose by obeying the Lord. And as the story goes, Jesus went and he raised the girl from the dead. 
there were fishermen in a boat that had fished all night and caught nothing. But along comes a carpenter from Nazareth, and he tells them to fish from the other side of the boat. It did not make sense to them. They were seasoned fishermen, but their response was, Nevertheless, at your word, we'll cast the net on the other side of the boat. And there was an amazing catch. They understood they had nothing to lose by obeying God. We see the story of blind Bartimaeus that heard that Jesus was coming his way. And he began to shout, have mercy on me, son of David. And the crowd said, you need to be quiet. You're about to be disappointed. We don't think anything is going to happen. But the Bible says that he cried out that much louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped in his tracks and healed that blind man that day. What are you saying to me, pastor? All of these people in the Bible had one thing in common. They understood they had nothing to lose by acting on what God told them to do. And I want you to know, you and I have nothing to lose. I refuse to sit here until I die. I refuse to let circumstances dictate to me. I have decided that when God speaks, it's time to stand up. It's time to rise up. It's time to take positive action. We've got nothing to lose by obeying the Lord. And then finally, finally, you take God at His Word. You take positive action based on His Word. And then, take hold of your breakthrough. Verses 5 through 7 of 2 Kings chapter 7. Something happens that is miraculous there. The four lepers who decided they had nothing to lose. They arise at twilight and they decide to begin to walk toward the camp of the Syrians. A miracle happened. The Bible said that the Syrians heard the sound of horses and chariots. In fact, they thought that the king of Israel had somehow hired the kings of the Hittites and the Egyptians to come and fight for Israel and help them to get their breakthrough and their breakout from the siege they were under. I don't know how God did it. I cannot explain to you how God did it. But God took the sound of four sick men, four men with leprosy, men that could have been missing noses and ears and fingers and toes, Perhaps they had to prop up against one another to even walk down the road and keep their balance. God took the sound of the footsteps of four men who were dying of leprosy and God turned it into the sound of the armies of the Egyptians and the Hittites. And when God performed that miracle that day, The Bible said that they left everything there. The Syrians left everything there and they fled for their lives. They left their their tents. They left their clothing. They left their, their instruments of war. They left their weapons. They left their donkeys. They left their horses. They simply ran away because they thought the battle was lost. But all it was was four leprous men who said, I'm not going to sit here till I die. We're going to take action and we're going to trust God. And most of all, the Syrians left behind their stores of food and supplies. And the word of the Lord came to pass. And the people of Samaria broke out of the city and they enjoyed the plentiful victory that God had given them. Listen, the siege is never forever. When you're walking in the will of God and you're walking according to the word of God, when you're willing to act when God says to act, the siege cannot last forever and the day will come when you will break out, when you will have a breakthrough and you will see the victory of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, praise God. Hallelujah for his faithfulness and for his goodness. Hallelujah. I know that you feel boxed in. I'm sure there are days when you feel like the four walls are closing in around you. 
And I'm sure there are days that it affects you emotionally and spiritually when you feel as if you're not sure where you're going to turn or what you're going to do. But if you will take God at His word, if you will understand that you have nothing to lose by taking positive action based on God's word, your breakthrough can happen. I want to speak this morning to those of you who may never have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let me ask you a simple question. What do you have to lose by trusting Him with your salvation? Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. What do you have to lose by trusting Him? You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. I have been with people who don't even believe in God, who somehow have developed in their minds that there is no God. But can I ask you today, if you're right and there is no God and I'm wrong, what will I have lost? I will still have lived a wonderful life. I will still have been happy with the life that I have lived. But if I'm right and there is a God, if I'm right and there is a heaven and there is a hell, and you're wrong, then my friend, you lose everything in the end by not trusting Christ as your, as your Savior. If you trust Him, you can gain a life that is lived in relationship with the God who created you. If you trust Him, you can gain the life that He created you to live. If you trust Him, you can gain heaven. If you trust Him, you can gain eternal life. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose by trusting Christ as your Savior. You see, we all start life as sinners. But there's good news. The good news is that Jesus gave his life on the cross and paid the price for my sin and your sin so that we don't have to. By simply believing on him, we can have eternal life. And we can know him as we were meant to know him. I want you to pray with me this morning. I first of all want to lead those of you in a prayer who have never asked Jesus to be your Savior. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And I'm going to ask you to believe on Him today. Believe that He died and He rose again. Believe today that you've got nothing to lose by taking God at His word about salvation. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you this morning. I thank you that you made a way you made a way for me to go to heaven you've made a way for me to live the life I was created to live I can't do it on my own I believe you died for me and I believe that you rose again so I ask you to come into my heart be Lord of my life I want to serve you and live for you all my days. Thank you for changing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're in the parking lot today and you prayed that prayer for the first time and you asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, would you please note that on the little envelope in your bulletin or on the tear-off sheet and drop it in the bucket so that we can be in contact with you this week. If you are listening or watching us, on a live stream today and you have prayed that prayer and you've given your heart to Christ, would you just message us on Facebook and would you let us know that you've done that so that we can be in touch with you this week. Now I want to pray for those of you that are believers. Maybe you're feeling squeezed. Maybe you're feeling surrounded. Hallelujah. I love that song we sing sometimes. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by God. You are surrounded by God today. He is your shield 
and your protection. He is your refuge. Under his wings you take refuge. You dwell in the secret place of the Most High and you abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You belong to him. Today, Father, we pray for those that are believers that are feeling hemmed in, Lord. They're feeling under siege by everything that is surrounding them. Lord, I pray that your word through the Bible, through a message they hear, through a devotion they have, Lord, through a prompting of the Holy Spirit, God, that you'll give them a clear word and you'll show them the way out. You'll show them, Lord, that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that you are the source of victory and strength and health, God, in that time. Let encouragement come through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we pray. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, let deliverance come. God, deliverance from fear and deliverance from oppression and depression. Let deliverance come, we pray this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, dry those tears of frustration and anguish. Hallelujah. Oh, God, give rest and sleep, Lord, to your children. God, that have struggled with sleep because they're worried about the future. Give rest and sleep to them. Let there be a breakthrough and a breakout for them, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Once again, I would ask you to please be patient, if you would, and allow our parking ambassadors uh, to release you from the parking lot so we can do so in an orderly way. Uh, Also, to remind you that they are waiting. If there are those of you that brought the Lord's tithe and your offerings with you, you can use the envelope inside your bulletin. And uh, you can drop that in the bucket on your way out. Pastor Sharon and I are going to make our way to the curb over there very quickly uh, because we want to see you and we want to wave at you and give you air hugs because we love you and we miss you and we look forward to the day when we'll all be meeting together again. God bless you. May the Lord watch over you and keep you. Stay safe and stay well in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.